Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Happy Sea Otter Awareness Week 2023. We're so excited about this week. It's fantastic. If you've ever wanted to learn anything about sea otters, this is the week to learn from some amazing partners. Uh, and we're happy that we can educate you this evening. Um, my name is Chanel Hasten. I'm the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. Um, and we have Jane Bakary, our Executive Director for the Alaka Alliance, joining in on this webinar tonight as well. We'll have a little dual presentation. So lucky you all to hear from the both of us tonight. Um, so I'm going to let Jane kick us off um, to start the webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, we're pretty excited to be here at the beginning of Sea Otter Awareness Week. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview um, about the Alak Alliance in case you're new to um, uh, understanding that we're here and what we're doing, and uh, a little bit on the progress that we've made towards reintroducing sea otters to Oregon. And I'm going to let Chanel change my slides. <laughs> So um, people often ask Alaka, where that word come from? Why is that your name? Well, Alaka is a Chinook jargon um, word that means uh, sea otter, quite simply. So um, it's it's part of our name. And uh, Chanel, next uh, slide. Um, and we are um, an organization of tribal conservation, nonprofit, and community leaders and partners with a shared vision. Uh, that an Oregon coast 50 years from now is one that where our children and grandchildren um, can coexist with a thriving and robust population of sea otters and a resilient marine ecosystem. And so our origin story, though, goes back to the 1990s uh, to Dave Hatch. Uh, Dave was a member of the Siletz Indian tribe, and um, he was building a dinghy with his son, Peter, and they were looking for a name for that boat. And he came across the word Alaka, and he thought that sounds like a great name for the boat, but it also um, got him thinking about, you know, there's a word for sea otter um, in the Chinook language, but we don't have sea otters in Oregon. Why, why is that? Why are they missing? Why does it matter? And is there something that can be done? Um, and so he sort of gathered a group of like-minded folks that were interested in coastal issues um, and had an understanding of our history here, our ecology, and um, they uh, had an informal alliance called the Alaka Alliance that was thinking about how do we bring sea otters back to Oregon. Um, Dave unexpectedly died in 2016, and that group of people um, decided to get a little more formal, and um, the Alaco Alliance was organized and uh, incorporated in 2018, and we're a 501c3 organ-based nonprofit. Uh, we now have a 13-person board of directors that leads us, um, an executive director, and a staff of three right now. Um, and so um, one of the things that's really uh, foundational to our work, and uh, particularly because of uh, the, or the founding of the organization, is uh, tribal engagement and leadership. And so we do have uh, four of our, our 13 board members are tribal members right now. And we also have an advisory council that helps to guide our work. Uh, Chanel, next slide. So our mission is quite simply to restore a healthy population of sea otters to the Oregon coast and in the process to make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and more resilient. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, the, the origins and the, the tribal connection is really foundational to our mission. Um, and so restoring those cultural connections that have been integral between Oregon's coastal Indian people and sea otters um, is something that's already also very important to how we do our work. Uh, Chanel, next slide. So a lot of the folks that we spoke with, that we speak to, um, don't realize that we don't have sea otters in Oregon. Um, they see them at the Oregon Zoo, or they might see them at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. And there's sea otters currently in California and Washington, so maybe they've seen them there. Um, so before the maritime fur trade commenced in the mid-1700s, there was a robust 
population of sea otters that extended from northern Jap Japan up to Russia, across to Alaska, and all the way down south to Baja, California. Um, they, they estimate there were probably 200 to 300,000 sea otters in this area. And they think that the population in Oregon was maybe around 4,000 animals. Chanel, next slide. And so we also know that sea otters were in Oregon, not just because there's a Chinook jargon word for sea otter, but there's a word for sea otter in a number of the indigenous languages that are found um, amongst the coastal Indian tribes in Oregon. And so I'm not gonna to try to pronounce these, but as you can see, uh, there's a handful of different words that mean sea otter. Additionally, this place-based, a place is along the Oregon coast, like Arter Point, Arter Crest, um, that indicates that we did historically have sea otters in Oregon. Uh, next slide, Chanel. Um, but by the early 1900s, as the maritime fur trade wound down for a couple reasons, first of all, the, the population of sea otters had pretty much been decimated. And secondly, there was the uh, there were treaties that actually started banning um, the hunting of uh, marine mammals. There were very few sea otters left. They they estimate that there was probably one percent of the original population of sea otters left in its historic range. Um, so a few remnant populations survived. You can see that uh, by the yellow stars on this slide. Um, next slide, Chanel. But those remnant populations were enough to provide the basis for recovery of the species. So the yellow on this slide indicates where there are current population, currently populations of sea otters in their historic range. And as you can see, um, uh, I guess I can't point, but um, there's a big area between Washington, uh, thank you, Chanel, <laughs> between Washington and Central California um, where there are no sea otters. And this they did originally um, uh, live here. So that's what we're looking to fill, about an 800 to 900 mile gap. Uh, next slide, Chanel. Um, so why sea otters and why now? If we haven't had sea otters in Oregon for over a hundred years, what difference does it make um, if we go a little bit longer without them or if we never have them again? Um, one of the reasons it's really important to think about bringing sea otters back into our near shore marine ecosystem is that they are a keystone species. And uh, keystone species means that they significantly and disproportionately affect the structure and the function of the ecological, com ecological community within which they exist. So, um, you know, I think uh, a number of you have probably heard the word keystone before. Think about wolves, grizzly bears, beavers. So sea otters are also really important in that way, in particular to our kelp ecosystems. Um, you may have heard over the past 10 years or so, we've had what um, has been called sea star wasting disease, which means there's been something that's been affecting uh, sea stars along the entire west coast of the US that's caused a huge decline um, in these species, um, including the sunflower sea stars, which prey on sea urchins. And so what has happened is that we've had um, an overpopulation of sea urchins, and sea urchins in turn prey on kelp. So we've had a loss of a lot of kelp along the entire West Coast. Um, without sea otters also eat sea urchins, so they help to keep a balance in these ecosystems. Um, it's also important to think about bringing back species to the historic range. It helps provide for uh, diversity and a balance in these ecosystems, um, and um, it allows for some redundancy. So in the case of sea star wasting disease, without an additional predator like sea otters, we end up with urchin barrens in many areas along the West Coast. Um, I also mentioned that it's important to restore cultural connections. Um, there's uh, evidence between stories that elders have told um, and also the stories and the regalia and the ceremonies that many of our coastal tribes have that sea otters have been very important um, to uh, many of our uh, indigenous peoples in Oregon and in the areas where they have historically been found. 
Um, and finally, there's broader species conservation benefits. Um, the southern sea otters, which is a subspecies of sea otters, they're found in California, and they're listed um, as endangered on the endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. And so there's active recovery for that species. Um, by reintroducing and broadening the range of sea otters north and making connection between the northern sea otters in Washington and the southern sea otters in California, we can uh, provide for a more, more robust genetic pool and hopefully um, help uh, expand the oops, expand the um, the species throughout their historic range. Uh, next slide, Chanel. So what has the Vidlock Alliance been doing? Um, as I mentioned, we were incorporated in 2018. We came up with our first strategic plan in 2019, and we've since updated it twice to reflect the progress that we've made and the understanding that we continue to um, evolve uh, regarding what where our work is most important, how we can make a difference. Um, there's three primary uh, strategic initiatives or components to this plan. The first is to complete the scientific assessment and policy work that needs to be done uh, to understand if reintroducing sea otters is feasible within Oregon and what the impacts of that reintroduction might be. So we feel like it's really important to our mission to get the science right. And we've spent a lot of uh, effort um, over the past five years uh, doing different elements uh, within the strategic initiative. Um, the second is to build a consensus um, in the region that bringing back a population of sea otters, having a thriving population of sea otters in this area is a goal worth pursuing. Um, and this means that we're doing things like talking to folks like you. We've done a lot of engagement. We will continue to do that. And we're trying to find ways to uh, more directly engage with uh, communities and stakeholders that could be directly impacted if there is, uh, if there is a reintroduced population of sea otters in their area. Um, only when we get enough work done under these two components um, will we be able to proceed with a restoration of sea otters in very carefully uh, chosen sites. And when I say we, I'm talking very broadly um, regard, uh, with about partners, about the alliance. Um, the Alaco Alliance itself will not be the entity that will physically with sea otters back in the water, but we will be working with our partners at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who have the federal authority over the species that would actually do that work. And we're helping to support what information they need to be able to make decisions towards that outcome. Uh, Chanel, next slide. So as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of work over the last five years. Um, I think one of the most significant things that we accomplished was we did complete a scientifically based feasibility study uh, in early 2022. Uh, this was authored by six uh, scientists that are experts in the field of ecology and other areas related to sea otters. Um, and it was uh, also recognized as um, significant enough that when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service completed their feasibility assessment related to sea otter reintroduction in the region in, 2020, in July of 2022, um, they largely referenced our work. Uh, so um, it's foundational to how we move forward. It helps to identify where we have information gaps. Um, and one of those information gaps is around better understanding the socioeconomic impacts. And so we've done a couple studies to further inform um, that those areas. Uh, one is we completed a high level um, economic assessment study in April of last year. And then we just more recently completed a study that looks at the impacts, the benefits in particular um, to uh, tourism and travel related industries on the Southern Oregon coast. Um, we've also done some work related to GIS ass assessments and mapping. Um, we are currently in the process of doing uh, some research looking at the presence and distribution of sharks along the Oregon coast so we can better understand what the impact from predation and while sharks don't actually eat sea otters, um, they can uh, bite them, which ends up being lethal for sea otters. So as we think about potential sites for reintroduction, we want to better understand what that impact from a, a predator like a, a shark might be. 
Um, we've also worked on um, crafting some amendments to the Oregon Near Shore uh, Conservation Strategy that ODFNW is considering. That's the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, where um, we've weighed in on a study that's looking at the potential impacts um, from climate change on a potential reintroduction of sea otters in different areas. Um, and finally, really significant over, we're a young organization, we're only five years old. Um, in 2022, the beginning of 2022, we hired our first employee, who was Chanel. Um, I came on as a second employee in July. Um, and then uh, this summer, we've been able to bring on two more staff, uh, permanent staff. Uh, Kyle Motley is our coastal community coordinator based in North Bend, Oregon. And Tabitha Rood is our science and policy director. Uh, who just started earlier this month, and she's based in uh, Gold Beach, Oregon. So really excited to bring some additional capacity on board to help move this work forward and keep the momentum going. Uh, next slide, Chanel. Um, so one of the things that's uh, really critical to our work is connecting with people. Um, and, and Chanel has been you know, it kind of spearheading this work from the very beginning and um, we're excited to have more capacity to do some of this work now because um, it's it's broad. It's the coast belongs to everybody. It's not just folks that live on the coast that care about these issues. It's folks throughout Oregon and really throughout uh, the country and, and internationally. Um, people have reached out to us and expressed support, um, sometimes questions and concerns, and we want to be there to answer that. So um, we look for a variety of ways you can reach us. Our website is fabulous. It's a bunch of great information. Um, and then we are all over the socials, thanks to Chanel. Um, we have a great uh, monthly newsletter um, that I encourage you to subscribe to. We keep it short and sweet, but very topical. Um, and it gives you all the updates on what we've been doing along with our partners. Um, and then we do things like this. We do webinars and presentations and tabling, and we have events. Um, we Our biggest fundraiser is the Oregon Ardor uh, Beer Challenge uh, that was is held in the spring. We've had it twice now, so it's becoming an annual event. Um, and you can look for us in articles. Uh, Oregon Public um, uh, Broadcasting uh, recently had myself and Peter Hatch on to talk about Seattle Reintroduction Oregon. And earlier this year, National Geographic had an article about sea otters in which our board president, Bob Bailey, um, was interviewed. So we're, we're getting out there. Next uh, slide, Chanel. So finally, like next steps, what, what more needs to be done if we've been doing all this work over the last five years, what is it gonna take to actually get sea otters back to Oregon and in the water? Um, one of the things that's really critical for us to be working on now, and especially now that we've got a bit more capacity, is uh, developing the plan for reintroduction and management of sea otters. Um, we, there's a lot of things, a lot of uh, different areas that need uh, you know, the experts to weigh in on and to think through very carefully. Everything from where might they be introduced? Where are the animals coming from? What are the logistics around transporting animals uh, to Oregon from other places? Animal welfare, um, how are we going to monitor these animals? Who's gonna be doing that monitoring for how long? And it, what are the options for managing animals uh, once they're in the water if they don't do what the models predict that they might do? So there's a lot of different uh, details that need to be thought out and uh, developed into a reintroduction plan. Uh, secondly, we've already begun collaborating regionally. Um, as I mentioned, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service completed a regional feasibility assessment last summer. And um, when they uh, consider whether or not to reintroduce sea otters to that 800 mile gap on the West Coast, they're thinking regionally, they're not thinking state by state. So we are already engaging with uh, our partners in California and also with the service to think about more broadly um, while LACA is certainly focused on Oregon, uh, whatever happens in Oregon would need to be coordinated and aligned with what, what might happen in the region regarding reintroduction. Um, we Now that we've got uh, uh, coastal folks uh, that are sort of our eyes, ears, and voice on the ground, we're doing more focused stakeholder and community engagement, uh, particularly in the South Coast, because it has some of the best habitat uh, for sea otter reintroduction, but along the entire coast. 
Um, so we're excited to be able to do more just listening and reaching out and meeting with folks, um, especially in what seems like a safer post-COVID world. Um, we are embarking on a study that's going to be looking um, at both the benefits and potential impacts to fisheries in Oregon. Um, there is some concern among some stakeholders about what the potential impacts might be to our sea urchin fishery in this uh, state, along with uh, the commercial crab fishery. So we want to get some answers to help fill those information gaps. Um, along with some additional areas that were identified in the feasibility study where we need to kind of, we need to better understand what the benefits and impacts could be. And finally, um, we, we want to uh, further engage um, and collaborate with our tribal partners, not just in Oregon, but also in the region. And so um, we're excited that we have the engagement of Oregon tribes on our board, but uh, there's a lot of tribes in the uh, region that uh, could potentially be engaged and um, play a leadership role in this work. Uh, next slide, Chanel. Finally, um, we're an alliance and it, it really does take a village to do this work. And um, we are very grateful for all the partners, whether they're agency partners, conservation uh, organizations, corporations, and just uh, individuals like you who support this work. Um, we're, we're very lucky um, to uh, have the village that is working with us uh, to bring sea otters back to Oregon. So I think I'm gonna pass it on to Chanel. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Okay, change of pace, folks. Put your paws up if you are ready for some sea otter trivia. That's right. I'm gonna throw out some really fun facts about sea otters, but you're gonna have to work for it. So grab a piece of paper um, and your scout's honor because you're gonna judge yourself, your own paper. Um, I'll give the answer immediately after the question. Uh, and if you get all answers correct and you are honest, write it in the chat that you are correct and maybe you'll get something special in the mail later. Um, okay, everyone got their piece of paper or open your notes on your computer, that works too. First up, question number one. For at least how many years Sea otters were an important part of the culture of the people along Oregon's coast. A, 200, B, 1,000, C, 5,000, or D, 10,000? For how many years? Locked in? Great. The answer is D, 10,000 years. How do we know that? That is because sea otter bones were commonly found in shell middens, uh, which were just big piles of discarded animal bones, shells, and other artifacts, artifacts from ancient human occupation that were found along the coastline here in Oregon. And the prominence of sea otter bones in these middens shows the importance of sea otters in the life of the early native people, as well as the health of the ecosystem sea otters once inhabited. And they also found uh, from the bones of sea otters in these middens that both northern and southern subspecies of sea otters were found along the Oregon coast. Uh, so that meant that those species intermingled, which increased the genetic diversity of the whole entire sea otter species. So hopefully that is something positive as well um, that we can hopefully return sea otters to the Oregon coast and increase that genetic diversity all over again. Okay, question number two. What are the modern threats to sea otters? A, oil spills, B, climate change, C, sharks, or D, all of the above? If you listen to Jane, you already know one of those. The answer is all of the above, sadly. Um, oil spills can compromise the insulation of a sea otter's fur and cause hypothermia. Um, and it can also poison the animal if they ingest it during grooming. So that is horrible. Um, changes in ocean conditions resulting from climate change pose new threats to sea otters. Warming ocean waters accompanied by increasing acidification can also affect the growth and spread of kelp forests, urchins, and other shellfish that are the food for sea otters. 
And as Jane mentioned, shark attacks are um, something that are make sea otters vulnerable in the water. Although they don't eat the sea otter, um, the bites are lethal, um, puncturing their skin and their fur, and thus they can't keep warm in the water. Okay, a true or false question. The sea otter is the largest member of the weasel family, yet the smallest marine mammal in North America. Largest member of the weasel family, yet the smallest marine mammal in North America. All right. And the answer is true. The otters are part of the Musclidae family, which is a family of carnivorous mammals that you can see here. That includes skunks, weasels, wolverines, and badgers. And they are also the smallest marine mammal. And they are also the only ones that lack blubber. Next question. How long do sea otter lives, live for on average? Five to 10 years, 10 to 15 years, 15 to 20 years or 25 to 30 years? I wish they could live forever <laughs> if it was my, my take on it. Okay, ready? It's actually kind of a, a two-part answer. So if you got either one of these correct, I will take it. Um, but males in the wild live 10 to 15 years. And for females, they live um, about 15 to 20 years in the wild. But in captivity, they have been known to live for up to 25 years. So if you got either B or C correct, I will take it. Okay, what do you call a group of sea otters, a canoe, a raft, a school, or a cuddle puddle. My personal favorite. What do you call a group of sea otters? All right, the answer is a raft, B. They love to rest in groups and sea otters have seen, or researchers have seen concentrations of over 1,000 sea otters floating together. And they often are floating together in a bed of kelp um, that they can wrap themselves in so they don't float away. Although I do love cuddle pedal still. <laughs> I wish it was really that scientifically. Um, but next question. What percentage of body weight does a sea otter on average need to consume every single day? A, 25% of their body weight, B, 35% of their body weight, C, 45% of their body weight, or D, 50% of their body weight? Okay, and the answer is eight. 25%. So they have to eat 25%, one quarter of their body weight every single day. And their diet includes sea urchins, crabs, mussels, clams, uh, and they are often known to use tools. One of the only marine mammals to use tools to open uh, their food, often floating on their back, and they take a rock and smash it down on that crab to open it. Um, and they spend about nine to 12 hours foraging for food. So they are either grooming themselves or they're always eating or maybe sleeping too. Okay, next question. Sea otters can hold their breath for as long as A, five minutes, B, 10 minutes, C, 15 minutes, or D, 20 minutes. Also, no cheating. Don't go to Google and try and find the answer to these questions. I didn't say that in the beginning, but I'm watching you through the internet. So hopefully don't do that. Okay, how long can they hold their breath for? The answer is eight, five minutes. So they can hold their breath for up to five minutes, but 
they don't always do that every single dive because that would take a lot of effort and energy. So most of their dives are shorter and in shallower waters. Okay, let's talk about how deep a sea otter can dive. So how deep can they dive? A, 35 meters or 115 feet. B, 15 meters or 49 feet. C, 25 meters or 82 feet or D, 45 meters, 180, or sorry, 148 feet. How deep can sea otters dive? And the answer is D, 45 meters or 148 feet. So while they're capable of diving at least 45 meters, they prefer coastal waters up to 30 meters deep. The shallower the water, the less time they spend diving to reach food. They will use their sensitive whiskers to locate small prey inside crevices or their strong forepaws to dig for clams too. Okay, let's see how many of you know the answer to this question. How many hairs can be found in one square inch of a sea otter's pelt? 5,000 to 10,000 hairs, 10,000 to 50,000 hairs, 100,000 to 250,000 hairs, or 600,000 to 1 million hairs? All right. And the answer is... D, 600,000 to 1 million hairs per square inch. They have the thickest fur of any animal on the whole planet, and that is because they lack blubber. So they use really, really dense, thick hair to keep warm in the coastal waters that they live in. Um, they actually have two layers of fur, and they're seen grooming themselves all the time because they're actually putting a pocket of air between those two layers of fur. So they're underlayer um, closest to their body actually never gets water on it. So every time you see them dive underwater, if you watch any video footage of that, you'll see all these bubbles leaving their fur. And that is basically their warmth jacket is leaving them. So every time they surface, they immediately start grooming again, pumping that air back into their coat. Their fur is about a thousand times more dense than human hair. Um, but it wouldn't do any good if it was smooth and perfectly combed. So their hair is actually um, really tangled and kind of uh, sticky, spiky. Um, if you look under a microscope and that helps it stay poofy and kind of intertwined with each other. So it traps that air in there. Okay, what is a normal body temperature for a sea otter? A, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, B, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, C, 89 degrees Fahrenheit, or D, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. What is their normal body temperature for a sea otter? Okay. It is D. 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They have an extremely high metabolism rate, which is how, um, which helps keep them with a high body temperature of nearly 100 degrees. Since they have to eat so much food, a quarter of their body weight, they burn through three times as they burn through food. Sorry, Woo. they burn through food three times as fast as one might expect a mammal of their size. So they are running warm all the time. Okay, next question. True or false? Sea otters um, have similar eyesight above and below water. Oops, I think I forgot to put have there. My apologies. Sea otters have similar eyesight above and below water. True or false? The answer is true. There is evidence that sea otters can see just as clearly above water as they can underneath the water as well. 
They can actually squeeze their lenses through their pupils into a more rounded shape when they're diving. And that rounded shape bends the light more, which compensates for the reduced bending affected by water. And the light properly reaches the retina and enables a clear image. So if you look at the difference of, say, a sea otter eye compared to a sea lion or a seal, you can see the sea lion and seals, their eyes are kind of bulging out. And so the sea otter pushes their eyeball out more underwater to kind of mimic that same shape of the harbor seals and sea lions. So I think that's incredible. That's one of my favorite facts. I think that's really, really cool. And also sea otters can close their ears and their noses every time they dive underwater. Another fun fact I just threw in there for you. Um, so that concludes the whole trivia. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go fast, but um, how did you all do? Let me know in the chat. Did anyone get them all correct? Because I will be very impressed. Got all. Suzanne, way to go. Bravo. That's amazing. Which one stumped you the most? Nice. I'm glad you, you learned something, Sean. Great. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I hope, I hope you did learn something new today. Um, there's obviously so many more fun facts about sea otters that I can tell you about, but I had to pick just a couple. Um, so to conclude our presentation a little bit, uh, I want to talk about some events that we are coming um, up with next. So for Sea Otter Awareness Week, we still have plenty of things to do. Um, I will be down in Newport um, on the Oregon coast tomorrow at Yakuna Head Outstanding Natural Area doing a live stream float down the coast. We're kicking it off. Um, I can give you the link for that in a second in the chat. Um, and then we'll also be tabling probably inside the visitor center there because it looks like there's rain in the forecast. Uh, and then we'll, the next day on the 27th, we'll be at the Oregon Coast Aquarium tabling by the sea otters. And then we'll also be doing the same thing at the Oregon Zoo on Friday the 29th and Saturday the 30th. So come see us there in Portland. Um, also, you're the first to hear, we have our virtual Sea Otter Science Symposium is back. Um, so we invite speakers from all over the world. Uh, and this year's theme is the interrelationships of underwater forest. So we have a great lineup of speakers. It's on our events page on our website. The registration is open, so please go check that out. Uh, we also have a really fun um, fundraiser on October, the 13th, Friday the 13th, Furry Freaky Friday, um, down in Langlois on the Southern Oregon coast. And tickets are available for that. If you go on our website as well, it'll be super fun. And we're unveiling a sea otter sculpture from local artist Elizabeth Roberts that she made it all from uh, marine plastic that's washed up on the beaches of Oregon. So it'll be a life-size version of a sea otter. And I've seen pictures of her process and it's going to be amazing. So you don't want to miss that. Um, and also, if you don't follow us on social media or you haven't joined our email newsletter, you can do that right now. Why not? <laughs> uh, if you love sea otter content and fun scientific information, um, please do follow us. And all of our previous webinars and symposiums are on our YouTube channel. So if you ever have questions about that or want to re-watch re things, um, check out our YouTube channel. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature. I know we've got a couple throughout the presentation um, and or you can use the chat box too because we kind of have a smaller audience so that works out. Um, but if you did get all correct, Suzanne, I will, I will email you for a fun little prize. Um, okay, so we had one question in the beginning. Um, when people think they're seeing sea otters now, say off of Newport, what might they be seeing? Um, so most often, uh, 
People say they see sea otters running along the beach or swimming in the ocean on their stomachs. Uh, it's most of the time a North American river otter, uh, which I have a slide just for this question because we get it so often. Um, so sea otters, you can see, have those big back flippers that are great for swimming, horrible for being on land. Meanwhile, river otters, they live on land. Um, so all four paws are about the same size. So they are easily maneuvering, running along the beach, running over rocks, um, foraging uh, in the ocean. And uh, they're also found near fishing piers because people throw them heads of fish and they eat them. Uh, sea otters don't eat fish, so they wouldn't be happy with that. Uh, so most of the time people are seeing river otters and even though there's river in the name, uh, they still swim and forage in the ocean sometimes by river mouse. Um, and there's also sea lions and harbor seals that if their head pops out or sometimes it can resemble um, what looks like a sea otter if that's what you're wanting to look for. Uh, but uh, it's very, very rare. There are some, a handful of occasions throughout the year where a lone sea otter usually comes down from the Washington population, usually a male, um, an older male looking for a new female raft of sea otters. And unfortunately we don't have one of those. Uh, so it's not out of question to maybe see a sea otter, but it's very, 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 very rare. Um, so thanks, thanks for that question. Let's see, what's the other questions we've got? Um, Jim asks, seems like a lot of seaweed this year, especially in Depot Bay, is kelp making a comeback? Is that not kelp? Um, so yes, there's a really nice population of uh, kelp forests off of Depot Bay. Uh, kelp, bull kelp is an annual, um, so it begins its life and ends its life within a year cycle. So often with big waves and big storms, which I know we've had recently on the coast, uh, dislodge the kelp from the rocks that they're holding on to and thus washing ashore. So it's not uncommon to see larger amounts of kelp usually in the fall and winter. Um, but uh, there still is some healthy populations of uh, kelp on the Oregon coast. It's just not as vast as it once was. Um, before we had urchin barons. Jane, if you ever want to jump in here, let me know. <laughs> no, no, you're fine on that one. I was going to okay. uh, see what you wanted to say about the next question regarding yeah, let's see. this. Um, Kathy says, the translocation of sea otters to San Nicolas Island is considered to be a fail by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, even though the population is growing. Has that created any barriers, hindrances, in moving forward to reestablishing sea otters in Oregon? Um, I feel like it's not a fail anymore because the population now is growing. Um, I, right? I feel like this is something we discussed at the... Seattle Conservation Workshop earlier this year. Uh, yeah, um, so I, I think it depends on how you define failure. Uh, I think the expectations for where those animals were going to be um, were um, challenged by actual animal, animal behavior. <laughs> so they did not necessarily stay in the area where they were originally reintroduced. Um, and that did cause some conflicts with fishermen in the area. Um, I think also that uh, memories are long at times. And so uh, there's perhaps some uh, residual concern about what might happen um, with CRs being reintroduced in areas and uh, better understanding if they move from those areas, what can be done to quote manage them. Um, uh, the Rio Fish and Wildlife Service staff that worked on that reintroduction, um, lots of lessons learned. Um, and one of those being, we can't necessarily predict even with the best of models animal behavior. Um, but we do want folks to understand that they are wild animals. Uh, they may not necessarily stay exactly where you put them, but also just understanding the benefits and um, figuring out if there are impacts, understanding what those could be and how we might mitigate them prior to reintroduction. So um, I don't think it's necessarily hindering uh, reintroduction efforts in Oregon. I think if anything, it's helping to inform them. Great. And Jim mentioned the curious life of seaweed by our friend Josie Eislin. 
is at the Pacific Maritime Heritage Center in Newport, and its final weekend is this upcoming weekend. To see it, it is truly beautiful and fantastic. Um, some really amazing visuals and maps uh, about kelp, so definitely go visit it if you are in that area. Um, I might have to go see it again for a second time when I'm there tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, okay, super. Any other questions or what is your favorite sea otter fun fact? I always love asking that. Who knows something interesting about sea otters? Anybody? Ooh, yes. They have pockets in their armpits. So something really cool about sea otters is that, so they have to groom themselves, like I mentioned before, constantly to get that pocket of air in between those two layers of fur, which means they need to be able to reach every part of their body. So their skin is actually really loose. It's only attached in a couple places. And so they have extra skin under their armpits and since they don't have real pockets, um, they, once they're on their backs, which is like, you know, their dining room table, they can stuff some food in their armpit while they're cracking something else open, or they can put their tool, their favorite rock in their armpit while they're opening up some other fun critter, clam or sea urchin. Uh, so that's always a fun little one. Oh yeah, so sea otters eat so many purple urchins sometimes that it stains their teeth and can also stain their bones, the purple pigment. Um, that also happens with green sea turtles from eating so much algae. That's why they're called green sea turtles, not because of their shell, it's because their fat is actually green. Oops, threw in a sea turtle, fun fact in there. You got a bonus. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. So sea otters have short blunt skulls and fracture resistant teeth. So that's how they can eat those hard shelled invertebrates without breaking their teeth. And they have a bite force uh, similar to a, a black bear, about 80 pounds of force. So that is how they can crack open a lot of things as well. They don't have a rock. Um, Rita said, Rosie, or Rosa is the oldest living sea otter in captivity at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. She is 24 years old, was a mama to 15 pups in the surrogate program. Oh, that's so wonderful. I used to volunteer with the sea otters and when they had river otters many moons ago. Um, so I got to work with Rosa. That was so fun. Great fact, Rita. Nice, and Suzanne saw Rosa on Saturday. How fun. Hopefully I'll get to Monterey soon to see their sea otters. Jane, what's your fun fact? What's your favorite sea otter fact? Well, mine was the pouches under the arms, but mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I think just the swimming on their backs and the fact that they, uh, it's not I mean, it, it's fun, but it's also really critical to their life cycle. The fact that they have to teach their young pretty much everything. Yeah. And sea otter pups have a different type of fur when they are born. So they are so fluffy. They are like a little cork that floats in the water. They can't dive down or go underwater. They'll just pop right back up, which is why the mom has to leave them on the surface and tie them up in kelp so they don't float away while she goes and dives and gets food for them both. Um, and eventually that fur becomes adult sea otter fur. And then that's when the mom teaches the pup how to dive and forage for food for themselves. They also lack clavicle bones. So the bones that we have here, which is also another reason why they can uh, groom themselves so efficiently and bend over and get all, get their arms all over the place. Um, also why they're really not great at walking on land too, because they can't really push themselves up super easily. Also why it's really difficult to tag them because they can pretty much reach a tag uh, that could be used for monitoring almost any place on their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard. You have to get super inventive to figure out how to tag sea otters. <laughs> oh. 
Uh, I see that um, there's some Halloween ideas popping up in the chat also. So mm -hmm. hopefully this has inspired everybody for the upcoming holiday. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm just writing. So this is another question. How do sea otters handle adverse events such as storms and wildfires? Hmm. Uh, and storms. So recently in Monterey Bay, there was a huge storm um, and there were several hundred sea otters in a raft out in the kelp forest in front of Monterey Bay Aquarium that they had never seen that many before. And I think it's what they do when there's huge waves and storms is gather together and make one super raft. Um, it's, you know, safety and numbers and protection. Uh, I think that's their their best bet there. Um, for wildfires, I'm not sure that affects them too much since they are in the water, um, but I'm sure smoke inhalation is not great for any animal that breathes air. Um, I think uh, the impact that wildfires could have and perhaps remains to be seen as we've had more wildfires in recent years is uh, the erosion and uh, the impact that can have on water quality when we have winter storms. Um, they did find this past year uh, down in California, um, there was increased incidence of toxoplasmosis around, um, in the sea otter populations down there. And they think that was a result of the runoff from uh, the uh, high rainfall they had and um, the impact that that had on the amount of pathogens. So, um, you know, a really good question and probably something that we need to be aware of as uh, the wildfires have been so um, intense over the past five years or so. Awesome. Um, okay. Margo has a fun fact. While sea otters are diving, their entire metabolism adjusts to maximize use of oxygen in their bodies called the dive response. I didn't know that. That's super cool. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's see. Lindsay says, how much do sea otters sleep every day and when? Are they up during the night? Uh, so sea otters can sleep for about 11 hours a day. Another reason why I feel like my cats remind me of sea otters all the time. Um, sleeping, eating, um, and that's pretty much it. And uh, so they, they forage during the day. Um, so at nighttime, yes, they, I, I believe they usually are just sleeping. Good question. Hmm. Let's see. Kathy said, pups are born with visible teeth. I was lucky enough to witness a sea otter birth in Morro Bay and got a photo of the baby in those teeth the next day. Best day ever. Oh, yeah. Those sharp little teeth. Let's see. Jim says, agree with Jane. Thinking about the Curry County storm warnings and the Smith River complex burn area, what happens to the cleanest river in the U.S. when the hillsides flow down in the rain? Yeah, well, kelp forests um, help with coastal erosion, so that's a positive thing. Um, and sea otters help with water quality, especially in estuaries. Um, that was a paper done in the Elkhorn Slough because when sea otters were present there, the water quality also increased. Um, and that's because they ate crabs, which ate slugs, which ate algae that grows on the eelgrass. So without the sea otters, there was a lot of algae on the eelgrass because the crabs were overeating the slugs. Um, it's a whole thing. But uh, so, yeah, it's another positive reason about sea otters being little climate change warriors uh, in the kelp forests and eelgrass estuary ecosystems. All right. If that is it, 
can end a little early. But that was fun. I love learning some new things about sea otters. Thanks for some of those fun facts, everyone. And we hope to see you at some events coming up, uh, whether that's virtually or in person. And uh, anything you want to share, Jane, as we bid adieu? Just want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, there's a lot of great things coming up this week. So check the calendar um, and hope to see you uh, at a few events in October also. Thanks. Yes. And you can check the Defenders of Wildlife page has the full Sea Otter Awareness list of events with all our other partners for Sea Otter Awareness Week. So also go check that out. Um, and, and that's it. Have a wonderful evening. Happy fall. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.